Change is sweeping across Afghanistan. For the people, the primary catalysts are successful elections, the signing of a bilateral security agreement, the installation of a national unity government. In the eyes of the International Security Assistance Force, they are check marks in the march to the end of one mission and the start of the next. The transition from eyes have to resolute support means that Afghanistan can continue to evolve as an independent nation, free from the threat of terrorism and the Taliban. For the U.S., it means the end of Operation Enduring Freedom in 13 years of war. How's the exercise? From the time we took over, it's been a race of time because we knew resolute support was coming in December. Accomplishing what you wanted? Lieutenant General Joe Anderson is the last commander, ISAF Joint Command, a job he says is as fulfilling as it is demanding. So every, every day we pushed and worked on everything from logistics to communications to medical to the Air Force to, to things like a National Engineer Brigade and the National Transportation Brigade on, on the side of the police. So it's been, it's been a constant push process. This particular day, according to Anderson, is a good example. In the morning, it's a visit with soldiers of the Afghan National Army and their chief of staff, General Sher Mohammed Karimi, an Afghan Anderson describes as a patriot and friend of the coalition. He's one of the guys that I leaned on. I don't know how I personally would have survived without him. I think many of my predecessors would tell you, tell you the same thing since IJC's been around for the last five years. They're waiting for you. The practical guy day to day and all the things that we were trying to do from fielding equipment, training forces, leader development, etc. It was all General Karimi. Karimi himself says that because of ISAF support, the future for Afghanistan is better now than and ever. After the BSA, there are more hopes of cooperation and support. Everybody is happy, both sides. So I have, uh, uh, you know, I'm foreseeing for seeing a good future for the for the ANA. He has helped this country get to where it is today. Uh, however, you know, he's 68, turning 69, well experienced, well respected, and a good leader. I think he said it, he's got them on a good foundation, a good setting for the future. I think it's a logical time now with this assessment of new leaders, changing government. It's a logical time for that transition. See you soon. Transition is making itself known at every layer in the land. Later, on this same day, we visit the Deputy Minister of Interior, Mohammed Salangi, at one time the Kabul police chief, now responsible for maintaining all of Afghanistan's interior security. One has this monthly briefing. This is followed by an appointment with Deputy Minister of Interior for Policy and Strategy, Masood Azizi. In the backdrop of pleasantries and chai, there is talk of the changes. Okay, the army responsible for Both men are part of the current Afghan administration, a cabinet President Ghani has pledged to make better. The goal is that we do better service. We end of the day that we need to provide a very good service to the people. Uh, with the people, we need to build the trust among the people and the police where we can serve them better. Last stop of the day is with the current Kabul police chief, Lieutenant General Mohammed Zahir. As with them all, the IJC commander looks to discover how they're preparing for the time when the coalition won't be their primary support. While here, Anderson uses the occasion to introduce Maryam Wardak, who's looking to advance gender equality. It's an issue like many others that rests in cultural sensitivity. Kabul has a female police chief, Zahir says he's an advocate of increasing the role of women. By bringing them together, making it personal, opportunity has room to grow. A lot of these guys today, between the chief of the general staff, the deputy minister of the interior, you take the deputy minister for policy and strategy, the Kabul city police chief, through your support of what they're doing, through your efforts of what they're doing, through your encouragement of what they're doing, I think that all helps them move the ball forward, but sometimes need positive reinforcement. In the last year, the number of coalition and U.S. forces in Afghanistan has decreased by more than 30,000, with more on the way. Forward operating bases, combat outposts, installations of various sizes and composition are going away. Here in Bagram, places like Coalition Village, Camp Avenger, Infantry Village, Hotel California, they are now just memories. For the International Security Assistance Force Joint Command, the pace is relentless. 
between the retrograde and redeployment, the downsizing, getting ready to, you know, from 84 bases to 20, to 29 today, uh, to all the people getting out of here, all those things competing for time and demand. Keep up the good work. Lieutenant General Joe Anderson calls it an education. All right, Pete, thanks. So it teaches you a lot of patience. You're always learning ways, uh, I, I hate to use the word tactics, techniques, procedures, but you're always learning different ways how to deal with things and, uh, and, and in some cases not deal with them. So uh, it, it's a continued, uh, every day is an education of some kind about something, uh, about either some part of what our coalition does or doesn't do or what our partners do or don't do. The goal by the end of the year is to bring coalition forces down to just over 12,000, with U.S. troops representing more than two-thirds of that number. They'll become the core of the Resolute Support Mission, aimed at train, advise, and assist to the Afghan National Security Forces. And while the ANSF today is better than it was, there are still challenges. Strategies, threat assessments, policies, campaign assessments, you know, planning, programming, budgeting, execution, contracts, human resource systems, payrolls. Uh, these are all things that we have a hard time with and they have a long way to go. The issues that need to be faced and overcome, he says, are in part capability, but another decisive factor is culture. It gets political, it gets cultural, it gets tribal, it gets personal, it gets everything. They clearly, depending on what your background is, where you're from, and how you're impacted by things like neighboring countries, uh, other tribes, et cetera, or, or, or plain and simple what the Taliban, for example, has done or not done to you, and how you react to that based on what your family's investment has been. Afghanistan, the country, and its people have gone through a lot. Over a span of years, the International Security Assistance Force, Operation Enduring Freedom, have introduced new concepts, methods, tactics, approaches that were at times accepted and sometimes not. Well, there was times I've been here, I didn't know how we were going to get anywhere. Uh, I don't know if I ever got overwhelmed. I know they did. So many major events drove, you know, from the fighting season itself to the, from Loya Jurgis to Ghani Islamic festivals to Nauru's to election to runoffs to, you know, ballot recoveries. There were so many major events that for as a forcing function, and those forcing functions this year were hugely effective in terms of enhancing command and control, logistics, intelligence combined arms integration, et cetera. A lot of those things really helped move them along this year. Officially, the year ends with the close of Operation Enduring Freedom and the International Security Assistance Force. The countdown, according to Anderson, is well underway. How do you man a checkpoint? How do you secure the border? How do you run patrols? We've got to move on beyond that now and talk about bigger picture here, which is what next coming year is all about.